Hello, hello, and welcome back, everyone, to the next two hours of uh, me talking to you about drone data processing for land surveyors. Um, I know, as with all things, you have probably been through a couple of these Zoom meetings before, so you get to hear yet another script. Um, so I will hand it off to my associate, Mr. Trey Swan, to handle that. Good afternoon. Uh, thanks for joining the virtual conference. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about drones. Earlier in the day, we talked about why flight ops matters and collecting data. This next section is going to be all about processing the data the drones collect. So we're going to do a deep dive into how to troubleshoot photogrammetry issues and get more accurate data into CAD. So it'll be focusing on the processing of that drone collected data. It's going to be presented by Logan Campbell, who you just met. Uh, Logan is the founder and CEO of Aerotas. He is an ASPRS certified photogrammetrist. Started working with surveyors back in 2014 and has, has really written the book on using drones to, to collect survey grade data. Uh, Aerotas provides human to loop drone data processing for surveyors. And we freely share guides, instructions, checklists, best practices developed with thousands of surveyors. Uh, over tens of thousands of drone survey projects. And so Logan's goal today is to really share everything that we've learned along the way with you. Uh, the goal is to impart all the knowledge necessary for you to build this proficiency in-house. So this is definitely not a sales pitch. This is gonna be showing, we don't wanna hide the football. We wanna show you uh, everything we've learned so you can avoid the pitfalls and, and things that we've struggled with for quite a while. Uh, the information, regarding uh, your speaker and any handout materials is available through the conference app portal. Uh, in the conference app, you'll also find information regarding our exhibitors and sponsors, notifications, as well as a chat feature that will allow you to network with other attendees. So if you have not already taken a moment to explore the conference app and, and book a meeting with our exhibitors, we really encourage you to do so. Uh, so today we're going to be using the Q&A panel for you to ask questions. So take a moment to, to find that button. It can be a little bit different depending on what device you're using, uh, but it's generally found on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. So for me, I've just got this QA bubble and I click that, it pops up and that'll allow you to uh, ask questions. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator and so it's going to be my job to make sure Logan answers your questions. So definitely more questions, the better. As they come up, let's like we would definitely we want to interrupt Logan, ask as many questions as you can. So the more questions, the better. I'll grab those questions. I'll get those answered uh, for you as quickly as possible and have Logan answer them live. But then I'll also try to give you a written response as well. So definitely use the Q&A button frequently uh, by all means. And with that, I will turn you back over to our speaker, Logan Campbell. All right. Thank you, Trey. And I will just jump straight into things uh, once I get my button working. Cool. So um, as Trey mentioned, please, please, please use that Q&A session. I love interacting with everyone. Um, for those that saw me on the last, uh, the last session, I covered everything about flight operations um, and answered a bunch of questions. So please do. I like being able to throw stuff at the crowd or something when I, whenever I'm giving talks. But um, you know, it's a little different in Zoom, but such is, uh, is life these days, like it or not. Today, what I am covering for the next two hours is we are going to be covering the complete office workflow for drone photogrammetry for surveyors. In the prior two hours, I covered flight operations, so all of the field ops stuff. There will be about 5% of overlap between these two, just as I cover the other things, but that was almost entirely field operations, and this will be almost entirely office operation or office workflow for drone data processing for surveyors. That means we're going to be covering photogrammetry, line work drafting, getting it all into CAD together, and troubleshooting errors throughout the entire process. Because anyone that has worked with drone data before knows that, yeah, there are errors and it can be tricky sometimes. The principles that I laid out in my last uh, presentation will all hold uh, true in this too. If your drone program isn't saving you time and money, then it isn't working. Whether you waste your time in the field or waste it in the office, whether you waste your money on drones or waste it on hardware, uh, our recommendation is don't waste time and don't waste money. And so these will be all of the same things that I've said before. In just like before, what I am focusing on is not treating every single project like a research project. This isn't trying to land a rover on Mars where you can spend a billion dollars on it and only do it once. 
We are trying to make maps repeatable, efficient, reliable, cheap, fast, easy, better, all of the same stuff that it's always been before. Again, I apologize if some of this is repetitive, but for anyone that wasn't here, the reason we know this is Aerotos provides drone data processing for land surveyors. That is what we do. We, do, uh, we give advice on, on flight operations, but what we do as a business is everything that I'm going to show you today. We do photogrammetry, we do line work drafting, we put everything into CAD, we do image processing, we do all of that magic to actually get valuable results, valuable files and deliverables out of drone data. So that's why we know what we do here. And in fact, this, like Trey mentioned, the point of this presentation is not at all a sales pitch of, hey, hire us. In fact, we're not trying to say we have some magic software, some magic trick that we're doing that no one else does. In fact, quite the opposite. In this presentation, we're really kind of opening the book and showing you everything that we do internally to process uh, because, well, one, to support the community and also because we think this is how we establish better relationships with our clients of not trying to hide the ball that we're some, you know, magic workers that can do stuff that no one else has, knows how to. No, we're just photogrammetrists and CAD drafters and CAD technicians that like to think that we're pretty darn efficient and good at what we do. And the reason we got there is because we've made a ton of mistakes along the way. And here we're going to show you how to adjust for those mistakes so that you can save time, save money, and get high quality data out of your drone. About me, like I've said before, I actually started a career in finance and statistics and have been working in drone-based photogrammetry for surveyors and engineers for the last six years or so. I am certified by the American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, um, as any good photogrammetrist should be. And so that combines all of my academic stuff with them at the field or the real world side of doing this for a business for the last six years. As with before, a good drone program should increase your flexibility, allowing you to do new projects that you couldn't do before, serve as a force multiplier, scale up and down based on need. It should save you time and money, which means it should have less time and manpower in the field, reduce overall costs, but like I said before, it should also not increase any of your office processing time. In fact, it should take less than before because that's what this section is all about, is saving that time, saving money in the office and getting you better deliverables. So if you are having any struggles with any of that or if you're new to drone photogrammetry, this is the right presentation because lots of people spend tons of money on computers and tons of money on fancy, uh, really specific software and then still spend 10, 20, 30 plus hours per project and still don't get the highest quality data and results and deliverables. But that is what we are talking about today. As before, avoid the common pitfalls. Don't use the wrong tool for the job. We've talked about this before. If it is a job that makes sense for a total station, then a drone, no amount of skilled drone processing is going to fix that. If you are coming here say, because you say, I need three hundredths of a foot accuracy out of my drone data, then this is the wrong presentation because a drone can't get you three hundredths of a foot accuracy and no amount of data processing wizardry or banging your head against that metaphorical wall will get you three hundredths of a foot accuracy. Um, don't overspend on gear you don't need. The last presentation that was all talking about drones. This is now all going to be talking about computer hardware, cloud storage, uh, and computer software as well. As I'm sure many people are aware, there are varying ways to do all kinds of different stuff with drone photogrammetry. And uh, a lot of them, some of them were cheap a couple of years ago and have been raising their prices like wild, but you can really easily spend 10, 20, 30, $40,000 a year on software licenses and subscriptions just to get this uh, stuff working. And depending on what you do, you can easily spend 10, 20, 30 thousand dollars on computing hardware and still be running into a problem. So like before, we will focus on how to get a good balance of that that makes sense from a business perspective. How do you invest in computer hardware optimally? How do you make sure you buy the right computer for the right job? As with last time, I said, don't buy the Ferrari drone because the Ferrari drone looks cool and is flashy, but doesn't do a job as well as a pickup truck would for a surveyor. Same with this, don't buy the Ferrari computer. A Ferrari computer is going to be really, really good at running the latest video game at 8K resolution and 120 frames per second, 
but it might also just not do what you need to for CAD data. So we'll go over computer hardware, among other things here. And again, that emphasis on saving time, saving money, making this actually a business proposition. Don't spend too much time in the office. That's, also, that's another focus. You can oftentimes spend a lot of money on hardware to try and, uh, and save time, but usually spending more money isn't gonna save you time. What saves you time is better workflows, better training, better education. Again, why we're here today, what I intend to uh, teach you and show you what we've learned. And lastly, once again, I know I'm getting repetitive with this stuff, but I can't stress it enough because this is the problem that we see all the time. Do not treat each project like a research project. You shouldn't be reinventing the wheel on every new project. It should be a beautifully smooth, wonderful, standardized workflow where you see data come in, you know exactly what it's going to look like through every step of the process, the data comes out, and it's what you expect. You need to have that nice, smooth workflow. You're not reinventing the wheel here. You're just kind of trying to get everything done right, efficiently, quickly, correctly the first time. We've talked about the drone surveying journey before. Start with basic photos and videos, just taking site pictures. You get your ortho photos and then high accuracy, high precision ortho photos. All of this is done in that first step that we call photogrammetry. Then you start working in 3D, your digital surface models, your point clouds, getting it into CAD drawing. That's the phase that we call line work drafting and putting it all together into final survey deliverables and integrating it into a consistent workflow all comes in what we call the CAD finishing step. And I will go over all of that in much detail. So to kind of take the big step back, that whole process again, the overview from getting from drone to full line work, which should be the goal of your program, Starts with mission planning and flight operations. That last session was recorded if you missed it. Um, so reach out if you want that. Um, then you go to the field, collect your data. And then the last three steps are the office steps. Photogrammetry, stitching all the photos together, drafting line work, extracting the valuable data out of that 3D model, and CAD finishing, doing all of the uh, data processing work to actually get it properly into CAD. Okay, and once again, this is what a final survey should look like. As this is a surveying conference, I sure hope that you guys have seen a survey before. And as before, the uh, beauty of a survey is that it often doesn't say what was collected from drone and what wasn't. A good integrated workflow will have some data from drone, some, uh, most of the imagery could be from drone, but really it's just an accurate survey because what matters is accuracy to the client, reliability, up-to-date imagery, that it's, and that it's done on time, affordably, and correct the first time. Those are the things that matter. The source of the data isn't really that important. It's that it's done on time, on budget, uh, and is accurate. So I'll go very, very quickly through mission planning, uh, just the high-level things again, because I'm actually going to be referring back to the mission planning a lot. Um, Mission planning, like that, I, everything that I covered before is all the questions of, is this a good site to fly for drone photogrammetry? Is it legal to fly here? What altitude? What overlap? How many GCPs? And we'll be experiencing that today when I go through a lot of the processing because we'll see a lot of those errors. As much as I'd love to come into this presentation and say, all right, we're starting with the assumption that your source data is perfect. That's not the way things work in the real world because sometimes people make mistakes. There are pilot errors, there are unexplained errors. You slept badly the night before and so you forgot something and you set your overlap wrong. So a lot of this is identifying the errors in flight operations and mission planning. So we're going, the reason I wanna go over mission planning briefly again is because I'm gonna be referring back to it so often when we say, hey, you see this error? This is actually a flight ops error. Or maybe it's something that, yeah, it's possible to use some photogrammetry magic to fix it, but really the best way to fix it is to have changed your flight operations, change your mission planning, things like that. You don't have enough GCPs. How can you use photogrammetry to make up for that? That sort of thing. Why care about mission planning? Well, I talked about that all before. Good mission planning saves field time, but the point of this presentation is to save office time. Photogrammetry takes a lot of time. Line work drafting takes a lot of time. It all takes time. So anything you can do, these little kind of mission planning things that cut the amount of time you need by 20, 30%, that's huge. 
If you're spending 20 man hours on a project and you can cut six hours out of that work, that's spectacular. No matter who you are, where you work in an organization, you want to cut the amount of time that you spend doing all of this stuff. And so mission planning matters, and we'll be working to identify those mission planning errors from the photogrammetry data, from the photos and ground control points, and things like that. And again, two-thirds of photogrammetry problems are caused by poor mission planning. We will see some examples of both photogrammetry problems caused by mission planning and caused by other things, typically errors in the software, the lighting conditions, blah, blah, blah. But um, the vast majority of issues are caused by mission planning. So having a good flight operations team is critical to getting those errors, reducing and removing those errors before they become a big problem. We've talked about this. Is this a good project for drone photogrammetry? The reason this slides back on this presentation is because all of these things like we talked about are good projects, huge range from half an acre to 500, up to 20 miles linear, low to moderate vegetation. If you are getting data for topographic mapping, great for a drone, all to surveys, a lot of that data you can get by drone, planimetrics, a lot from drone and volume calculations, spectacular, perfect for drone. But very but bad projects like super huge projects, dense vegetation, super high accuracy tolerances, underneath overhangs and underneath trees, there is no amount of photogrammetry magic that I could do that will let you see through trees. There's no amount of photogrammetry magic that with current technology can process 200,000 photos in a reasonable amount of time in less than a week. We could actually do it a little bit in, uh, for really large projects, but you're not going to do it overnight with something like that with hundreds of thousands of photos or 500 or 1000 acres isn't going to be done in three hours. Um, so that's, I, it, it's again worth noting that there, there are limits to how much photogrammetry can do. Now with those limits are really wide and we're going to hopefully expand your limits today too of what you can and can't do with photogrammetry drafting, uh, line work drafting and CAD work. But um, there are things, there are limits and I might point to those on some things. And I will very regularly reference the solution to a problem being to solve it in flight ops, not solve it in software and photogrammetry. Okay, so we are done with the repetitive part. Hooray, thank you, good. I uh, was tired of myself talking about flight ops already as well. And we can move into the office workflow, which as before are these last three steps in it. Photogrammetry, line work, CAD finishing. Those are the three major steps, the three big differences in it. As I've said, photogrammetry gets you the basic photos and videos, ortho photos and accuracy. In fact, that, that photogrammetry step is where all, not all, most of the accuracy of a project comes from. It comes, the difference between a tenth of a foot of accuracy and one foot or one and a half feet of accuracy, which for the record would be horrible by our standards, we would never deliver anything with a foot of error in it. Um, but photogrammetry is where the vast majority of your accuracy comes from when you're extracting data. It also takes the majority of the computer time. It requires a lot of computing uh, architecture. Line work drafting is another source of accuracy and depending on how you do it, it's less about accuracy and more about time saving. Line work drafting is about what features you extract, how you extract them in order to get the right data, make it manageable uh, for CAD for the next step, make it presentable and useful. Um, but it's not that much about accuracy. And CAD finishing is about making something usable. Um, so we'll cover all of that in great detail. So let's go over kind of the high level of these three things, and then we'll dive really, really deep into a lot of the details as well, including in uh, photogrammetry, exact software, and that sort of thing. And I should point out, now is a great time to ask, as I'm going through these high level things, if you are unsure of exactly like some of how these things interplay with one another, feel free to ask some questions. I might uh, have answers for them, but I wanna make sure people are clear on what these different steps are. So for example, photogrammetry. That's when you are stitching photos into interim files. You start with your photos, typically anywhere from uh, a small project, might be one or 200 photos. A large project would be tens of thousands of photos. Um, we have and do process all of that range. Um, but you start with your photos and your ground control data and you output typically a point cloud, maybe a very, very large one, an ortho photo and a digital surface model. Those are the typical outputs of the photogrammetry step, the digital photogrammetry step. 
This might be different than when you've worked with traditional photogrammetrists. Oftentimes they refer to photogrammetry as the whole process from stitching the images together all the way to drafting line work. But that's just because the architecture is different. For us, photogrammetry ends at the point cloud, the orthophoto, and this stuff isn't, can't really be practically imported into CAD at this point. So you start with these, these huge, you start with a huge number of photos and you end with very large files, these point clouds, ortho photos, digital surface models. And like I said, these photos are too huge. This ortho photo, I mean, heck, there are ortho photos that are 10, 20, 30, 40 gigabytes in size. Anyone that's tried to import that into Civil 3D knows that it's an absolute disaster. If you've tried to import a 20 gigabyte point cloud into Civil 3D, it's an absolute disaster. And honestly, it's so much data that you don't need. What you need are topo points, a clean tin surface, curb lines, poly lines, brake lines, utility panels, layers, all, of these, all that good stuff. But you need to extract that. And that's what line work drafting is. Line work drafting is actually taking that really rich data, that rich point cloud, that rich 3D model, that full resolution ortho photo, and extracting just the little valuable bits of it. And as you can see on here, there are just points, poly lines, sometimes a tin surface associated with it. And then finish it in CAD. That's when you kind of bring everything back together. You bring it back with all of the data that existed beforehand, your, your field data, your drone data, your historical records. You create a tin surface. You create your contours around that. You add in all of your imagery. You put it into printing sheets so that you can deliver it to a client and give someone a final survey. And your final survey should be indistinguishable from a conventional survey. At least that's the goal. So last kind of summary of this thing, you start with your photos, ground control data, and RTK or PPK data. That last one's optional, but we'll talk about RTK a bunch. Uh, and that is the step that then feeds into this kind of photogrammetry step. Photogrammetry has an output of an ortho photo, a digital surface model, and a point cloud typically. And that create, and the output of that step is typically going to be your 3D points, just XYZ points, a bajillion of them, uh, polylines, and that's usually in like a DXF file format if you're familiar, but it's basically just points and polylines. And you have to go through CAD finishing um, to actually get your final deliverable, which is a tin surface, contours, site culture, and that is typically in a DWG format. So it has all of that fun, lovely data that comes together from, uh, from CAD. Hey, Logan, so backing up to the photogrammetry outputs, can you go into a little more detail about what a digital surface model is and how that differs from, say, uh, a DTM or a DEM? Yeah, absolutely. So um, we, we'll get into this, but the point there, those three um, outputs, the orthophoto, the digital surface model, and the point cloud. Orthophoto is, of course, just going to be the imagery. Point cloud is going to be a 3D cloud of tens of millions of individual points, X, Y, Z. A digital surface model is the, autumn, is the full, rich, complete output from photogrammetry of absolutely everything that the drone sees. That means the surface is draped over, there, if there are trees there, it includes trees. If there are cars parked, it includes the cars. It's the full surface. Um, there are also the other types that Trey mentioned, uh, digital surface model, digital terrain model, and digital elevation model. Some people have very subtle distinctions between some of the last of them. I, I forget exactly what it is, but generally speaking, uh, digital surface model can, is absolutely everything, including stuff you don't want, whereas a digital terrain model is typically what you do want, which is going to be cleaned of things like vegetation, cars, debris, that sort of stuff. So with that, that's the, that high level um, step. Let's actually dive right into photogrammetry and exactly how it is, why we do it, what we're doing, and then start getting into uh, some of the errors. Now, I'm gonna start with the beginning because I mean, like anything, if your fundamentals are kind of off, you don't actually have a true grasp of, uh, of what you're doing. I could say photogrammetry is when you open pix 4 d and throw a bunch of photos at it. Sure, but it's good to understand at least the basics of what, what do we mean? What are we actually talking about when we say photogrammetry? The very basic concept of photogrammetry is creating 3D data from 2D photos. Strictly speaking, the definition is that it is the art and science of making measurements from photographs. And that's a great way to describe it. I really like that definition 
because it, it so clearly says that, yes, this is both art and science. There is an art and a science to it. There is the science side that is very heavily based on trigonometry and statistics and math that lets you triangulate all these points and calculate all of them. But there is the art of it, the art of seeing these errors, being able to find out all of the differences that's not perfectly deterministic. In fact, it's why photogrammetrists have a job is because software is absolutely unable to get everything perfectly right every time and self-diagnose errors. So this is both an art and a science, and there will be aspects of both of this as well. But that is the the really, really core idea of what photogrammetry is, is making these accurate measurements from photographs. And like Trey mentioned, the first output is a rich 3D model, a digital surface model. Um, and this, what we're seeing here is actually a digital surface model overlaid with the ortho photo that has automated contours drawn on it. And some of these contours on the raw dirt on the right actually look fairly nice, a little jagged, not very clean. But obviously on the left, we have artifacts caused by a tractor and some cars and all kinds of stuff. So the, the rich 3D model is actually very much not perfect. It's not a great output, not least of which is the fact that these files are so big that they don't work in the vast majority of software that people need to use. So photogrammetry, though, is about creating this rich 3D model. Now let's get, at, get into what photogram, uh, how we do it with photogrammetry. Photogrammetry, um, from the business workflow side of things, takes a lot of time, it's worth noting. It takes a little bit of human time where you need to go in, mark your ground control, get all that, I'll, I'll walk through our, our workflow there. But it also takes a lot of computer time. And the more photos you throw at something, the more computer time it takes. And what that means is that fixing an error and experimenting takes hours, not minutes. Changing a single setting on your photogrammetry software can take hours and hours and hours to even know the result of it. And huge amounts of data and heck, at scale, it actually winds up even taking a lot of electricity and all sorts of things. And improved hardware only does so much. In fact, upgrading from a $3,000 computer to a $20,000 computer might net you 20 to 30% lower processing time. That means it goes from, you just spent $20,000 to go from 10 hour processing times to eight hour processing times. So it's still one business day, which is a pain in the butt. So it's really li like with all things, what I'm gonna talk about is much more about workflow than it is about hardware. Getting the hardware right helps, and it certainly can save you a lot of money by not overspending on hardware, but getting the workflow right with your photogrammetry is the most important thing because while it takes a little bit of human time, that huge amount of computer time to actually process this all um, is really what winds up killing you. Now, it, I should probably talk about the actual um, technology of photogrammetry. Why does it take so much computer time? What's it actually doing in there? And it's pretty cool. The, uh, the photogrammetry software, or I'll take a, another brief step back and talk about the history of photogrammetry for a second too. Traditional aerial photogrammetry was done with in stereo, where every photo was uh, created stereo pairs with another photo, and a photogrammetrist would use all kinds of really cool different technologies like Kelsch plotters to actually take these two photos, take it from different angles, match a point manually from those two different photos, and after aligning them with the proper control and fiducial marks, you can create a 3D point where those two photos match. That's really cool. Modern photogrammetry is different. Instead of doing stereo pairs, it actually works by creating, uh, it starts by creating key points and image, images, which are uh, a few thousand to tens of thousand points in every single image. Matching the, those points with one another, you can think of them like tie points across every single, uh, uh, across every pair of photos. But then it does that with, instead of pairs of photos, with groups of two, three, four, 10, 20 photos all at once for a single point. That takes a ton of processing power because the amount of data that each photo has is actually a lot. And it's comparing each photo to every photo next to it. And that just takes a huge amount of time to do that. And when you change your camera settings or you change your processing settings even slightly, that actually real, I mean, it just has to redo everything. And that's why it just takes so long and so much processing capacity. It's just a ton of data, a ton of work that these computers are doing. Now, there are options for how you process photogrammetry as well. Um, 
the first thing, there are three major options of ways that people process their photogrammetry. And as I get into kind of the, the details of the technical side of photogrammetry, um, we'll, we'll cover that a little bit later, but there are three kind of architectures that you can do for how to process it. The first is automated cloud-based processing. That's going to be companies like Drone Deploy or Propeller that you might be familiar with, where you upload your photos uh, to an, a server somewhere. It's all automated, it's processed, and it spits out the photogrammetry output, your point cloud, ortho photo, whatever. Then there's local software processing that is owned by uh, Pix4D primarily, and Agisoft Metashape is another uh, perfectly acceptable software as well for local software processing. That's where you do it on all the photogrammetry on your own machine. And then, of course, there's outsourced photogrammetry, which is what a company like Aerotoss does. We uh, do photogrammetry where you send your photos to us, and our photogrammetrists actually work on that photo. We use uh, various softwares like Pix4D, among others to actually process all of this professionally for you. So we actually control all of the, or we have all of the hardware and software that you need to get you the right data. Benefits and drawbacks are uh, the automated ones are the cheapest by far. They're fast. You don't need to buy any computer hardware of your own, but the drawbacks are they're typically very low accuracy. So in fact, most automated softwares don't get the accuracy and reliability that surveyors really need. They do on some projects, particularly smaller projects can get you decent accuracy, but there are a lot of limitations with automated point clouds. They're much better for, um, for applications that don't have as high of a need for accuracy. Things like, you know, construction management where you're just tracking where trucks are parked and you're tracking just, you know, job site progress to make sure that a concrete pad was poured on this day where it wasn't there the previous day. Accuracy doesn't really matter there. But for surveyors and engineers, where you actually need that tenth of a foot reliable, verifiable, measurable accuracy, automated typically isn't going to get you there. So that's why people then often step to local processing software. That's where you run PIX4D, like I said. It's very, very customizable, and you have the most control over everything. Drawbacks are it's very expensive. PIX40 as a software can cost five to $9,000 just for the software, depending for a single license, depending on when you buy it. And as I will discuss, photogrammetry has a very, very long learning curve with a very long tail. Uh, even after six years, we still find new improvements in photogrammetry for how to improve this workflow, how to identify and resolve certain errors. And that's why there are people like us for outsourced photogrammetry because we, people like us, can spend the tens, many tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars on training hardware and software to have the most efficient workflow for photogrammetry. It's not like flight operations where you can learn it actually in a day pretty well and get pretty good. Photogrammetry just does have a long learning curve, but we're trying to, uh, to overcome that today. So let's talk about photogrammetry principles now. And now we're going, like I said, we're, we're going to be talking about mostly uh, what we're going to be talking about applies to local software processing and outsource. So this is what we do. And if you choose to do it yourself, this is how you ought to be doing and viewing your photogrammetry. Um, our principles are to work smarter, not harder. I've said that before that this is such just a straight up business decision. We don't want to spend eight hours on a project when we can spend two. The other thing is we use a very iterative process. Our photogrammetry process is a loop, not a line, because we almost never process a single project once. We process it a first time, and then we review it, and then we process it again, and then we review it, and we compare, and we, did. we make sure that we get gradual improvements until we get the highest accuracy we possibly can. Another part about our photogrammetry principles is that we absolutely think that a human in the loop is required at every step of the way. That doesn't mean that we need to go back in time and throw out technology and use Kelsch plotters again, as awesome of a technology as that was. Uh, but a human is there to spot errors and to spot issues that the photogram or that the software either does not or cannot spot. And the other thing is one of our key principles is to utilize parallel processing. That wherever possible, break something up into smaller, more bite-sized chunks. Because of how much time these it takes to go through this loop. If you can make that loop run faster, then you get more iterations, higher accuracy data earlier in the process. So let's actually go to this, uh, this circle that you see on the right, because this goes through um, what the actual steps that we go through in photogrammetry are. 
Now I should point out, I'll mention this later, we, our primary photogrammetry engine is PIX4D. We are proudly powered by PIX4D as our photogrammetry software. However, a, the vast majority of the principles that I'm going to talk about apply to whatever software you're using, even if it's Agisoft Metashape or any of the other numerous photogrammetry suites out there, and there are numerous of them. So our loop, what we do with everything is we start by processing stuff in the sparse point cloud. And I'll go in through this in uh, detail a little bit soon too. But we start with processing everything in the sparse point cloud. That means we start by just taking photos, we throw all of the photos at the machine and run a really, really quick, dirty, ugly, known to be inaccurate version of the process. Now this is to spot major blunders early. And I say that because major blunders happen a lot. Heck, that's what my whole presentation was. It's about flight operations issues. So running the sparse point cloud, just assume that all of the GPS data on the drone is perfect. We know it's not, but let's assume it's all perfect. Let's assume there are no GCPs. We of course want GCPs, but let's assume that's there. Let's assume the camera's calibrated perfectly. We don't have to worry about camera calibration. Just throw everything there and look for major errors. Spot your GCPs, check your overlap. Does the project have enough overlap? Is, does it match up with the area of interest? Did they mean to fly on this side of the project site, but they flew that? Was there some sort of glitch and all of the data was corrupted somewhere or someone accidentally sent you a bunch of inappropriate pictures from their phone? Hopefully that's not the case and that would lead to some really interesting photogrammetry projects. And thankfully that's an error that we have not seen, but please don't test us. I don't want to see that sort of uh, project, that sort of error, please. But um, that's the sparse point, point cloud. And that even for large projects can be done in half an hour, in an hour. And that's, I'm saying large projects, even up to 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 photos in a project, you can actually typically get that done, that step of the loop done very quickly. And then you integrate your ground control points in there. You're gonna mark all of your ground control points, mark, your, mark everything that you need, reprocess the sparse point cloud is, again, and go through your first set or another set of QAQC. Do your ground control points make sense internally? Are you in the right datum? Do you need to shift, translate, or rotate anything? Do you need to uh, switch to work in an arbitrary or a local coordinate system, depending on what tool was used in the field? I mean, good, the, the, our workflow works with everything. One of the problems that I see a lot with the automated workflows online with photogrammetry is that they only support WGS84. And surveyors don't have every project in WGS84 and lat long. You sometimes are using a total station and everything's 5,000, 5,000. You're using NAT83. Sometimes you're just localizing to some crazy old monument where you're working in NAD27 or something. So being able to uh, integrate, tie everything into your control points, that's gonna happen typically after you've integrated your control. Next up is actually integrating your checkpoints as well. So you should have checkpoints. We'll talk a ton about checkpoints when we talk about verifying accuracy in not too long. Uh, but integrating that and then making sure that those are accurate. Is everything accurate? Great, keep going. Are they not? Well, you probably should go back in, start running more uh, checks. And only then do you actually process the dense point cloud um, and run more QAQC, and then you start the loop back over again to make sure that all of your errors are tight. And every step of this is, is iterative and important to actually, getting the, uh, to actually getting that high accuracy at the end that you really need. Now, one question that is very common for us is, okay, great. Well, what hardware do you use though, right? I've talked about hardware, that's important. And like all of this stuff, we're not trying to hide the ball. These are our, um, this is our major, photo, our major hardware and software stack. We've recently got, uh, this was our kind of sixth generation of processing servers. We process everything locally, actually. I know there are much more complicated ways to do it, but we think that this is the most efficient way. So we have dedicated processing servers that are based off of the latest uh, AMD Ryzen architecture um, for people that are computer geeks like myself. RTX 2080 graphics cards, huge amounts of RAM, and um, a special type of solid state um, hard drives that are called M.2 SSD hard drives that uh, are, they, they make the difference for us. Now, what I should point out is that with this, for if you are a, uh, into computers and optimizing computer hardware, when you look at this, you will see that this is a very, very high-end consumer system not a high-end enterprise system. 
And that's like a lot of things I've mentioned before, it's very much on the cost conscious side of things because a box like this will run you on the order of four to $5,000 to buy the right uh, hardware for a single processing box. And if you do upgrade to the server grade stuff with your multi-threaded Xeon processors and your parallel uh, RTX graphics chips, um, you're looking at 10, 20, 30, $40,000 for a single computer and you are 10xing the price for 10% performance improvement. So we think that this is a really, really good sweet spot for getting it done very quickly, but also being aware that there are um, cost limitations and also parallel processing limitations. For us, we have a whole bunch of these processors, so we can actually throw a pro split a project up. Uh, I mentioned parallel processing is one of our um, one of our principles. It's oftentimes much better to split a project up across four of these boxes rather than a single Xeon processor one. And so that. Uh, that just once again is all focused on that speed and accuracy and shortening that iterative loop, shortening the cycle of that loop so you can repeat things more quickly. Hey Logan, question for you. How do you yeah. choose how small to cut? If you're doing parallel processing, how do you determine where to break it up? That's a great question and there's no clean answer to it though. Um, it really is based on a combination of well, I mean, the best way I could say it is photogrammetrist experience because it needs to be based on where the ground control points are, how much overlap this is, is the type of project, whether it's a linear project or more of a square project. Um, and so the, the overall site geometry um, and then the limitations of your processing computers and time. The, if you break it into a lot smaller projects, it will take less computer time, but more manpower. If you use larger blocks for breaking a project up, it will take a lot more computer time and a lot less human time. So there are these trade-offs that actually change based on each individual project and each individual project needs and site geometry. So it's, it's kind of a, it, it's a fantastic question, but it's one where there is no clear answer like 3,000 photos. That is the line. At 3,000 photos, you create a new block and do another one of 3,000 photos. That'd be cool if it was that simple. But with us, we typically see, again, depending on the, the geometry, that a single block is somewhere from 1,000 photos to about 5,000 photos at the upper end for a single photogrammetry block as we view it uh, before we'd want to start breaking it up. If, it's, if something came in that was 10,000 photos, for example, we would definitely run that in parallel processing. Um, whereas 4,000, anywhere, you know, four or 5,000 photos, we'd probably have a discussion for big projects to, to see what the most efficient way is. And heck, we might actually try it in multiple ways. And that's again, that parallel processing, see if we can get it done in a reasonable amount of time by processing one in a huge block and one in two blocks and one version in three blocks, and do it all at once. After all, computers, uh, they work overtime and they work nights and weekends. So sometimes it's really easy to, uh, to just process a whole bunch when you can do it in parallel at least. So another thing that I'll mention is uh, when talking about software, like I said before, we're powered by PIX4D. We love PIX4D, but PIX4D, like so many things survey, it is a tool, not a magic wand. And with PIX4D, if you were expecting me to come in and say, hey, if you set your PIX4D settings to this, 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 and this, check this box, uncheck that box, you're going to be disappointed because it's a photogrammetry tool and basically all of the various non dialed levers and checkboxes there uh, have an application in certain circumstances. And I'll go into a handful of them here, but um, I won't be able to comprehensively go through everything there. But what I can tell you and why I'm focusing so much on this workflow and these principles, because if you want to become a good photogrammetrist, if you want to nail down that workflow, get it reliable, it, it's not about the settings. It's about the workflow. It's about how you, how you conceptually address challenges when errors do crop up, how you look for challenges. And I can tell you that the main principles there are, for one, have a standardized workflow. Have it written down. You already saw that one circular chart. That was one of our workflows. I believe I have a slide in here with another uh, written version of our workflow. But have a standardized workflow. Don't go into a project blind trying to do, like I said, the science fair project where you reinvent the wheel every time. Start with a standardized workflow. Utilize checkpoints. That's extremely critical. You need to be able to spot errors. 
And in fact, that's the next part. Constantly check for errors. Assume there are errors in every single project to make sure that you can find them if and when they do appear. A lot of errors are not even like, they're not caused by humans sometimes. They're not caused by mistakes. Sometimes errors are caused by the lighting conditions changing just the wrong way at the wrong time. Different types of glare, stuff getting stuck to the lenses, things that you just can't really anticipate. And also re recognize that you have to adjust your settings based on the site. Not every drone, not every project site, not everything is created equal. And that's part of that whole, why there's no single workflow that works for everything. You have to adjust it based on, this, on the site. The cameras change, the camera calibration changes, the amount of vertical relief, the amount of lighting changes. Was it a cloudy day? Was it a sunny day? What, were you using RTK? Did you lose RTK signal halfway through? There are so many things that can cause this issue. So being able to adjust settings based on site is a critical part of any workflow that actually wants to um, get survey grade accurate data. Um, and it's also the type of thing that those automated cloud-based providers really aren't particularly capable of doing. They, they just can't adjust their settings properly enough to, uh, to get the level of accuracy that our clients typically require. And lastly is getting trained on photogrammetry. As much as I wish I was a good enough teacher that I could uh, spend two hours and give everyone uh, photogrammetry certificates, I'm not that good. But the ASPRS, the American Society for Photogrammetry and Remote Sensing, is a great resource. They are a nonprofit organization of which uh, we are proud members and we love them and support them. So they're a great place if you do want to go down the route for photogrammetry. Let's talk then a little bit about managing processing time in photogrammetry as well. As I've kind of said before op with the opening of this, a huge amount of processing time is actually decided in the field with mission planning. Now I've said that before. There, remember I was saying in the last presentation, there is such a thing as too much data. I can't stress that enough. There is too much data. Sure, if you had infinite budget, unlimited processing time, unlimited manpower, then take a million photos, who cares? But those are real world constraints. So there is such a thing as too much data. And a lot of times, by the time you've hit photogrammetry, it may already be too late and it's gonna take a lot of time. So if, you're, if you find yourself spending a ton of time on photogrammetry, take a step back and ask yourself if your mission planning needs a, needs a second look and you can improve it there. Overlap, overkill, flying too low, cross hedge patterns all take too much time. And as I've mentioned before, when you double your photos, it often 4Xs, your quadruples your processing time. It's non-linear. And for solutions, a good workflow is so much better, so much more reliable, and so much just, it, it's just better across the board than um, a good computer. That means a good field workflow, good office workflow will help you out. And lastly, like I said, is staging your processing. Start small, start with those sparse point clouds, no control, run it real quickly, discover big errors early, eliminate those errors, run it in rapid mode, and then scale up to get higher, to get full resolution, full accuracy, full everything, um, in order to get the most, to, to get the most reliable path towards the highest quality workflow. That's the way to do it. All right, I've mentioned ASPRS. This is another just plug for them. Like I said, they've been around since 1934. They are a nonprofit. They are the best way if you really want to become a certified photogrammetrist. They have uh, UAS drone specific programs that um, train people in drone photogrammetry. Um, so they're a wonderful resource and I am very happy to recommend them. There is my, my certificate there personally. And part of the reason I give them a plug is because they, uh, ASPRS, um, we utilize their standards for measuring and certifying accuracy, which for a good drone program is obviously pretty darn important. So let's start about measuring accuracy. To, to start with, what is the definition of survey grade? In fact, I've actually mentioned that a little bit on this presentation is what is survey grade accuracy? And the shortest answer is there actually is no perfectly universally accepted measure of what survey grade means. For those of you that have been in surveying for a while, you're probably familiar with the National Map Accuracy Standards, commonly used, uh, especially historically for topo maps. They're very simple to understand, um, but it, doesn't la it lacks the nuance and statistics of modern standards. Um, but it's a great way for saying how accurate does your, do your spot shots need to be in order to mark, say, a one-foot contour interval. 
Other things are the 95% confidence interval when you need 95% of your check shots to be within X range to, to say that it's Y accuracy. It's a very good statistical measure because it measures a standard deviation and average, but it often overestimates the accuracy of your need. Um, and then there's another one that, uh, that is common, the RMSE, which is the root mean squared error uh, of your ground control points. Now, this one's a tricky one because it is promoted heavily by the PIX4D quality report. And we will go into and walk through some examples of the PIX4D quality report and troubleshooting that data in just a moment. Um, but what this measures is the error of the ground control point relative to the model that PIX4D produced. Now, the reason that this is tricky is because when you use a ground control point, the error of that ground control point is no longer independent. In a way, it's measuring the point against itself. It's good for spotting major blunders or errors or picking up on those, but it doesn't actually identify the accuracy between your ground control points. So let's hypothetically say you have two ground control points that are 2,000 feet apart. And PIX4D or whatever software you use says that the accuracy is really good on that. Well, how good is the accuracy in between where you have no data? That you can't measure just by ground control points. And that's why the gold standard of, uh, of accuracy now is using the root mean squared error of independent checkpoints. That means something that was held back from the model that ideally the photogrammetrist, his or herself, doesn't even see or know. Um, but the root mean squared error of those independent checkpoints is the best way to measure accuracy. So I've said accuracy a bit too. It's also worth taking a step back because it is, uh, I think it's important to remind everyone of the difference between accuracy and precision. Accuracy means that something is centered well around a target. Um, or yes, that uh, accuracy is tight around a target um, and precision is how much it is spread. So what that means, the one that's always interesting is the one in the top right corner that you see that has low accuracy. All those dots were not near the truth, but they were all in the same point. So it's very high precision. Uh, that means they're all very, very clustered. So I'll be using those terms a lot uh, as far as accuracy and precision, because depending on especially some of the RTK processing workflows, um, RTK has a bad habit of very often being extremely precise, but with low accuracy. And we wind up with that thing in the top right. RTK data, especially when processed wrong, will have very high precision. The quality of those individual points will be there, but low accuracy. They may all be shifted consistently one or two or three tenths away from the point that you actually want to measure. That's a, a known error, so be aware with that with, uh, with RTK. All right, now for back to measuring accuracy though. I've mentioned this before, the, the gold standard for uh, accuracy is a document called the ASPRS Positional Accuracy Standard. You can Google it or if you email us after the fact, we will happily provide you with a copy free of charge. But the, um, they are called the ASPRS Positional Accuracy Standards for Geospatial Data. And it is a extremely wonderfully comprehensive guide to what accuracy means, how to measure it, and also how to certify it, which is pretty important. And it is based around using that root mean squared error of independent checkpoints and all of the requirements and procedures for being able to measure and report on that accurately. So measuring accuracy, part of using those standards, you need to be aware of systematic error. Um, the ASBRS accuracy standards require in order to certify to those standards at least 20 checkpoints. If you use less than 20 checkpoints, which most projects actually do, uh, it's still good, but typically can't be certified. But as I mentioned before, the, the quality report RMSE does not mean that something is accurate because those are ground control points, not independent checkpoints. Checkpoints have to be measured by a different tool. In fact, what I'm showing you right here on the screen on the right hand side is an excerpt from a uh, actual uh, project where the project, if you look at the, the bottom of this upper table, it, this is from the PIX40 quality report. It says, yes, this project had eight ground control points with a mean root mean squared error of 0.003 feet, three thousandths 
of a survey foot. Now, anyone that works in surveying knows that, you know, three thousandths of a survey foot, that's like less than the thickness of your pinky nail. Like, it's very difficult to ever get any accuracy to be measured in thousands. So it's almost for sure an overstatement of accuracy already. And in fact, if we look at the individual error on the ground control points at the bottom for these ones, yep, we're seeing the same thing. Each point is showing anywhere from zero thousandths error to one or two thousandths error. Now, the reason that that just is not a good measure of accuracy by itself is because it's not telling you what the accuracy is between all of those ground control points. Just from looking at this, we have no idea if those ground control points are 10 feet apart, 100 feet apart, 1,000 feet apart, or 100 miles apart. And that's, in order to certify accuracy, you need to know what the accuracy is through the whole project. And that's what those ASPRS standards are about, using those independent checkpoints to pick random spots on a project and if they all tie out to within a tenth, then you're, you have good accuracy within about a tenth of a foot. Some of the uh, specific requirements as well for measuring accuracy standards um, are about the uh, placement requirements as well, or the checkpoint accuracy and placement requirements. Now, to certify a project as, uh, as being accurate under the ASPRS standards, the checkpoints uh, need to be measured by an independent source of higher accuracy, and it shall be at least three times more accurate than the required accuracy of the geospatial data being tested. All right, let's translate that a little bit into uh, back into kind of normal English. What that means is that to get certified accuracy, whatever you're using to measure the ground needs to be higher accuracy. So if, if you're using a tool that has, you know, let's take a random number that might be off by a foot, you have a foot of accuracy, well, that'd be a pretty bad surveying tool for one, but that means that you couldn't, serve, you couldn't certify anything up to three feet of ac or better than three feet of accuracy. So when we're talking real world, what that means is you have to take the accuracy of GPS, which converting the metric at this point, because that's how all the slides or how all of the documentation unfortunately does it, um, GPS, for example, a Trimble R10, a perfectly fine piece of, uh, of equipment, nothing wrong with that at all. However, even the uh, manufacturer's specifications say that its maximum precision, and note that word, precision, not accuracy, GPS is very precise and not always accurate depending on the workflow, but the maximum precision of this is 15 millimeters vertically. And that means that the maximum that you could actually certify, heck, your checkpoints are going to have 15 millimeters of noise in them. Uh, so that means the maximum that you could actually certify is about 4.5 uh, centimeters, which when you do the math is right around a tenth of a foot vertical. So yeah, that means if you're using GPS, the best you can certify is about a tenth of a foot. Because some of you maybe have seen this chart before. This is just about, we often see people overestimate and overstate the accuracy of all of these things, right? We've seen drones that advertise, we can get you accuracy up to 300, 500 or whatever. Or, hey, we use GPS and we were able to measure the accuracy and it's, it's two hundredths of a foot accuracy, even though everything was measured with GPS. This is a chart that just shows, you know, pretty much as accurate as GPS can get. This is using Opus static solutions or rapid static solutions and that sort of thing. And it's just another one of those things showing that, yeah, even with two hour occupation times on your base station, you're still looking at vertical errors of two centimeters or more. Um, so it, I, I'm kind of just bringing, uh, trying to ground this conversation with what some of the real world limitations are. Why I am saying that, yeah, it's, it's a tenth of a foot and not 300. GPS, you really need to go to a total station if you need anything better than a tenth of a foot RMSE class accuracy. So based on all this and the table from those positional accuracy standards, if you are certifying your accuracy on a photogrammetry project, you do need to use those independent checkpoints. And the best that you'll be able to get with GPS is 2.5 centimeter accuracy class and uh, horizontal and five centimeter vertical uh, if you are using GPS at, to shoot your control and check data. Now, like I said, that's extremely good accuracy. If you're getting a tenth of a foot RMS vertical, that's going to satisfy pretty much all projects. But 
it, we're just going a little bit into the weeds for how we're, we're measuring all of this accuracy. Because while a tenth should be the, uh, the goal for every project is to get independent checkpoints at around a tenth or maybe two tenths or so, um, being able to understand and interpret that data is pretty critical. For actually certifying the accuracy as well, the ASPRS has a whole bunch of information here about the language that you use to certify it. There are two different standards. There's one called a tested to meet standard, which is that top one, and the second version called a produced to meet standard. This is the language of how you can actually certify the accuracy on individual projects. The tested to meet means that you followed every single step of the ASPRS positional accuracy standards and you tested it and here's its accuracy class. The produced to meet statement is more about having a known methodology and workflow like I've been going through before where you follow that workflow, you've done it and tested it before and so you can reliably say that it was produced with the goal of meeting this exact uh, accuracy standard but has not yet been tested for that standard. Okay, so that's been a lot about workflow and procedures so far, but I know what a lot of people actually came for is how do you do a lot of this troubleshoot? How do you look into the individual projects? How do you see, how do you identify errors and how do you fix them? What I should point out is with all of this stuff, like I said, always be on the lookout for errors because good processing does not necessarily mean good results. Lots of very annoying real world things happen because it's the real world. There are processing errors. PIC4D, Agisoft, all of the cloud-based providers do not process everything perfect at the right time. Humans don't process everything perfect at the right time. That's why we use an iterative loop. There can be corrupt data. There can be changes in lighting that mean that two areas didn't match properly. People can move GCPs. I had a, we had a project once that I felt really bad for the, uh, the client. He set his GCPs one day and he went and he flew the job site the next. And it was a, um, it was a big old just dirt lot construction site that they were doing grading on. He needed topo work, pretty standard stuff. Um, and the next day when he flew it, it turns out that a whole bunch of kids had done donuts on the lawn and they've actually did donuts over all of his marked GCP targets on a whole half of the project and tore them all up with their tires. And so he had no ground control points. So just because something processes well doesn't mean that stuff like that isn't gonna throw a wrench in your, uh, the best plan. So then the question becomes, do you know with that project, for example, where the GCPs were torn up, okay, well, how good is the accuracy in the area where you didn't have control? Was there enough control elsewhere to be able to keep good accuracy? Do you need to go back in the field and mark more? That's the photogrammetrist's job to be able to look at that and make the judgment call of whether the accuracy is going to be good enough in that circumstance, for example. That said, bad processing, if there are bad processing results, it does mean there is error. One of the uh, first examples that I'll give is all, all of these examples that I'm going to give you, by the way, are anonymized, but they are real world projects that we have processed for, for our clients and real world errors that we have picked up. So this one on the uh, right is a 2D matches graph where each one of the little yellow dots is the computed location of a photograph. And each one of the black lines represents how tight the matches are from one photo to the next. Dark black lines means there are a lot of matches and white lines or no lines means no matches. And if you look at this, the first thing is visually obvious. Well, I, I should actually take a step back and say this project as well. Um, no, I didn't have exactly the right slide, but this project was all green check marks on PIX4D. The ground control points were all green, all the camera calibration, you know, difference between initial and optimized camera calibration values. Everything was a green check mark and everything looked all hunky dory. But then you look down at this and you see, oh, there's clearly an issue there. Now, there are a couple of things, having worked on uh, many projects like this as a photogrammetrist, I know there are a handful of things that can cause something like this. Option the first is that there uh, is something there that can't be mapped, super dense vegetation or potentially a lake or water or something like that. Would mean that, you know, you can't stitch water with photogrammetry. So that's why uh, you won't get good matches there. The real question then is, okay, well, is there good data on that left side of the project? And that then depends on, well, what feature was there, what caused it, uh, and where the area of interest is. Now, this project in particular, I remember, was actually caused by a hill. 
that on that left side of the project, there was a very large hill where the uh, practical elevation of the, um, of the drone, the drone was closer to the top of the hill, so it, was, it didn't have the appropriate overlap, and that meant that there was lower quality data up there. Now, the ground control points were all appropriately set. I think there were eight or 10 control points. But what the end result of this was is that patch of white, of white um, area on the left was actually low quality data, even though the rest of the project was fine. So that's a great way, that's just one example of the things that you need to be on the lookout for um, for this type of data, because it's very possible that if you took the surface model or point cloud out of this, and you used the points on top of that hill on the left-hand side of the project, uh, it could be off by as much as a foot, even though the whole rest of the project is tight to within a tenth of a foot. So look at things like the 2D matches graph in addition to all of the top line statistics too. Here's another quality report. Let's actually go through this. And I, one of the things that I kind of like with this too is what I'm talking about right here is, is trying to train you for the right way to look at this. We're not actually looking at the photos that much. We're looking at the data. Because photogrammetry, like I said, it's kind of the art and science of, uh, of making measurements. This is very much on the science side. We'll talk about the art side a little bit later, but this is very much on the science side of looking at the data and being able to interpret the numbers. And what we have here is this is now a different project, but another real world project. This was actually flown with a DJI Phantom 4 RTK. So we actually have RTK data processed here along with everything else. Um, and if we look through it, we see a yellow and a red checkbox already. The first yellow one is that 91% of images uh, were calibrated and a whole bunch weren't. Okay, that's already a problem. That means a big chunk of the photos that we flew didn't process. And then more importantly is that the ground control point error is showing six tenths of a foot RMS error. That typically means that one or two of the points is probably showing a couple feet of error. Now I've said that that, that uh, measure where it says the RMS error of the ground control points, if that's green, it doesn't mean you're all good. But if it's red, it definitely means that something is very, very wrong. So let's actually dive into this. We're looking again at the, uh, the graph here. And what we have, what I can tell you right away from just looking at something like this, is a very classic case of overlap overkill. This is the example that I gave before of more, adding more data, adding more overlap and more flights does not solve problems of flight planning. This is a straight up 100% flight planning error because you can see here that the, the project was flown three or four or five times. There are areas where everything is overlapping multiple times and it's causing all sorts of errors and problems and that sort of thing. So our photogrammetry solution to this project in particular was, okay, let's delete a whole bunch of the photos. And it's funny that that's the way photogrammetrists work. You spend all this time in the field collecting data and we throw it out because it's like, yeah, just, just fly it right the once. If you fly it right the one time, that's all you need. You don't need to fly it four or five more times. Um, and also, here is the, uh, the, the individual ground control point. Now, as you can see, most of it is actually looking pretty good with uh, X, Y, and Z errors of a few hundredths of a foot. There's this one control point here, point number seven, that's off by one foot X, two feet Y, and three feet, or and two feet Z as well. So that's a bad problem. This thing needs to get reprocessed. But also, if you look over here to the right, what you are seeing is the number of photos that each control point is visible in and how many are marked. Um, in this case, point two was, or point nine was the most. It was visible in 138 photos. That is just the definition of overlap overkill. So that's a problem. So we reprocessed it again. And what our photogrammetrists did was they cut out a whole bunch of that junk data, threw it away, and we actually used a total of 404 images in this second version of processing. And if we even look at the time, it takes a lot less time. It was 18 minutes for the second one versus 38 minutes of processing time the first time we processed it with all of that junky bad data. This is even a pretty small project too. Um, 400 images, and now we're back to all green checkboxes, right? Everything looks great. And all green checkboxes, if Pix4D says it's perfect, then it's all good, right? 
Not exactly. Let's look a little bit closer into these, uh, these ground control points. So once again, we're not showing much air. Eh, you know, point 10 is showing about a tenth of a foot vertical air. That's definitely eyebrow raising for me. I don't like seeing a tenth on GCPs. But the real kind of sneaky one that's indicative of a much larger process is that uh, the photo count on the right. Now, our policy is part of our standard procedures internally is we mark every single uh, photo that a ground control point is visible in, we mark it. And the reason is because it can actually help you identify errors like this. And I can tell you exactly what happened having seen this one. On the right, we can see one of these points, for example, point four, it was marked, the, the ground control point was marked in 47 photos. And only in 34 of those photos does PIX4D say, yep, it looks like the right position. Our model agrees with it. That means that there are 13 photos that don't match up. That's a lot. And if you look closer, what happened is this project was flown in two flight lines at two different times of the day. There were lighting condition changes. And so that means that in this project, at least, with the lighting condition changes, it's what we, it was creating what we call a dual surface. That it was actually creating two versions of the surface right on top of one another. Now, it wasn't big. It, the difference between the two surfaces was about half a foot, maybe a foot. And in fact, if you were flying through the point cloud or the digital terrain model, it would be impossible to pick it out visually. It's small enough that it would kind of blend into the background noise unless you're looking really, really, really closely. And that's why I like focusing on these, these data points here because seeing things like this should be a massive red flag that there is a problem. Or very, like I said, at the very least, a red flag that you need to look into this sort of data more closely in order to make sure that you're not getting a dual surface because that can cause half a foot, maybe a foot of air that's very, very difficult to detect otherwise. So those are the types of things that an actual photogrammetrist should look out for. And so here is the last version that we process. Um, once again, the quality reports is all green, 354 images, 100% were calibrated. We disabled some of the other images that were actually flown more over water on this project. And uh, the RMS accuracy was on average 3.8 uh, of a foot of on-ground control points. And if we look in this, the proper version has, ah, perfect. All of the photos that we marked are verified as accurate. All of our accuracies on GCPs are checking out to within a tenth of a foot. This was integrating RTK data as well. And this one passed all of the rest of our checks and all of our photogrammetry processes and procedures as well, so that we could proceed to line work drafting and CAD finishing. A couple of other photogrammetry troubleshooting things, because we're actually, I mean, we've only got about 45 minutes to go, and I haven't even touched on all the CAD side yet, and that's really important too. Um, just other things to be aware of, things like high relief projects you really need to look at. In this project, it was flown at effectively consistent altitude. The GCP, the ground control points on the right are much closer to the camera. The ones on the left are much lower. That means that the, pro, the ones on the left are prone to have much more uh, accuracy issues than the ones on the right. There are other things that you need to be aware of that certain features can split a project in photogrammetry. This project looks like it's a single block and you have that water feature down the middle. Now, this one will likely show up no matter how you process it, I bet, Photogram that pix 4 ds quality report would give it greens across the board. Five ground control points, you know, three thousandths of a foot accuracy or whatever. And it was all processed in one block. But really, this should have been processed in two pieces. That water feature, uh, if there, I'm, it looks like it's wide enough that a single photo won't be able to capture both sides of the shore at once. So if it splits it across that water feature, this should have been processed in two projects, which means that it's going to need more ground control points to have the highest accuracy, even though that PIX4D quality report can say that you're green across the board. So not ideal, you need to be aware of the flight planning. This is one of those issues that um, would be addressed by flight planning, just adding more GCPs so that you had five on either side of the lake uh, or of the, the river there. Now, then again, I should point out um, if this was flown with RTK, because RTK lets you get away with fewer control points um, then non-RTK, then maybe this still could have been, uh, you could still get good data out of this. But those are the types of things that the photogrammetrist needs to look, at, look for. 
Same thing with insufficient ground control distribution. This project has all kinds of issues. It has uh, a bunch of ground control points all on the outer edges of the project with nothing in the center. Um, a skilled photogrammetrist would look at this and say this is totally subject to camera calibration issues. That when you process it, I, I mentioned before, uh, that we, we calibrate the camera, we recalibrate it on every single project. That's how we calibrate the camera. But when you only have control on the outer edges, your camera calibration has a lot more potential error to it. And it can introduce uh, what often appears to be a form of doming, where the, the whole project kind of domes and bulbs up in the middle or down in the middle. And it could be feet off in the middle and you wouldn't even know it because all the quality reports would actually, again, check out. So this is another thing that a client has to, or that a photogrammetrist has to look at and be able to identify. And I think you can see that this client kind of did a weird double crosshatch flying version as well. And this just goes back to that flight operations thing. Flying twice as much data does not fix the fact that the ground control is bad. Bad, like more data does not fix mission planning errors. It just makes them more difficult to identify often. Um, but adding more photos does not fix a camera calibration issue. More ground control points might. Um, these are another couple of projects that are kind of interesting. The one on the left clearly has five ground control points, but only in a small area. Again, it has double crosshatch, more data, but this is another one that a photogrammetrist would need to make the determination, okay, how accurate is the data on the far left side of the project? And the short answer is, if you're using it for topo, probably not good enough. If all you need is the imagery on there to give context to a site, but for example, it's a active construction site where you have, that, that is bounded by those five ground control points, then that's probably perfectly good data. Same thing on the right, we see another case of overlap, overkill, more data is just not getting you the, uh, the right results that you actually want. Hey Logan, I got a question for you. By all means. What is your camera calibration process? Great question. Um, the camera calibration process is pretty nuanced and I don't have too many slides for it because PIX4D does a lot of it automatically and the other photogrammetry softwares do as well. And like I said, the camera calibration starts with default camera parameters that come, that are just known in a database, they're published, they're, they're alive of what, or of, of what a camera's optimal parameters are going to be in terms of its radial and, trans and tangential distortions and its principal point, where all of that are. But it's known that those are different in the real world because of manufacturing defects, because of changes in temperature, humidity, air pressure, that sort of thing. So PIX4D uh, and all photogrammetry softwares use a, a process called bundle block adjustment that actually tries to predict what the camera parameter, what the calibrated camera parameters are going to be. And that is one of the things that is mentioned in here is this difference between initial and optimized camera parameters. A general rule of thumb is anything under 1% is pretty good. Anything over 1% is definitely an issue. Now, again, it's the type with, with calibrating our cameras, this type of thing is very site specific as well, because camera calibration procedures are different based on how much vertical relief there is and where the control is. It's much easier to calibrate a camera when you have higher overlap with significant vertical relief and lots of control on both high points and low points to get all of the different camera, camera parameters properly nailed down. Whereas if you have a site that is very uniform and very flat, it's trickier and you, you kind of use different policies and procedures. Once again, ours is typically iterative. So our philosophy with calibrating a camera is we do rely heavily on the software to do the, the actual mathematical part of the calibration. And this is where the real artistic side comes in of being able to check for different sources of error by checking the number of matches on those ground control points that I've talked about, by integrating tie points, by looking for areas where there are mismatches and adding additional manual tie points and checkpoints on high points and low points to ensure um, that the camera calibration is consistent across a project. There is a metric called the um, maximum orthogonal ray distance that's used on individual checkpoints and such that, uh, what the maximum orthogonal ray distance measures is 
if you imagine you have 10 photos looking at a point and you pick a point in each individual photograph that creates kind of these lines that should theoretically intersect all 10 lines should intersect at a single point in three dimensions and that's the true point however that's never the case because there is noise there are errors there are camera aberrations and imperfections and that sort of thing so maximum orthogonal ray distance measures how far the furthest ray is from the average center of all of those points. And that's another, like looking at things like that, like the maximum orthogonal ray distance on a subset of independent manual pie points and control points actually lets you identify when the camera calibration is wrong and you need to adjust your methodology. So this is something that it's it much, those types of errors are much more common on lower quality drones. So, you know, anything from my perspective, anything uh, below about $5,000, the Phantom 4 Pro even has more camera calibration issues than a Phantom 4 RTK or some of the higher end EBs that have very much more high quality cameras. Um, but it definitely still happens based on site conditions. Now I know that's not a perfect answer because like a lot of this stuff, camera calibration is a process, not a throw it there and everything actually works perfectly. So I hope that kind of points you in the right direction of how to look for camera calibration errors and then working through the different settings in PIX4D in terms of how you are assigning a confidence level and, and assigning initial values in each one of these, what photos you're using, what, uh, another thing that we use is being aware of multiple different aircraft and multiple site conditions. If a project was flown on multiple days, you might need to calibrate the same camera separately twice um, on different, the different days it was flown because the actual parameters might be slightly different, again, just based on ambient conditions, temperature, humidity, things like that can change the, uh, the camera calibration parameters slightly. Okay, so those are a couple of things. I'm going to keep moving through this because I want to just kind of keep working on this. I know there's, it's the tricky part about photogrammetry. I, I could talk like this for days and still not even scratch the surface of the number of possible errors that could come from photogrammetry. Hey, Logan, got a question about your software stack. Uh, do you use any software packages other than PIX4D? Yes, absolutely we do. That is definitely our favorite. We are familiar and have used on occasion things, uh, everything from the open source web ODM to Agisoft Metashape and Pix4D has, in our opinion, is probably the most reliable and best workflow out there. It is also fairly expensive. That said, our experience with a lot of these is that, like I said, it's a tool and the right tool matters but the person with the skill to use it is much more important. So other softwares like WebODM or like Agisoft Metashape are perfectly acceptable when used properly. And to clarify the question, it was, do you use any other software packages other than PIX4D to perform your aero triangulation? Uh, again, typically no for our aero triangulation, that's all done within those, um, those softwares. And again, there are different terminologies for how you triangulate all of this stuff. And the workflow may be slightly different with digital photogrammetry than traditional photogrammetry because of how a lot of these, uh, these processes are done. Um, the workflow from traditional photogrammetry and traditional aer aero triangulation through to PIX4D and its multi-camera bundle block adjustments, it's not a one-to-one -one perfect similarity between them. So with that, I do have to move on though, because I still actually have a lot of content to, to get to in the last half hour or so. But the point is with all of this, with troubleshooting, is that you need to be aware of possible sources of error. Be aware that camera calibration is imperfect, that poor mission planning is a possibility, physical camera damage, getting bits of mud or scratches on a camera lens happens. In fact, we see errors from all sorts of things. Rod height adjustment was wrong in the field. Someone set their rod height to negative six feet instead of positive six feet. And that puts a whole project on a tilt. GCP is getting physically moved. There are datum translation issues. That's another thing that I could talk about for an entire program is just datum translation issues to make sure that the drone where all the GPS is recorded in WJS 84 is rotated and translated appropriately to the project coordinate systems that you are using. That is especially an issue with RTK and PPK. So 
having specific workflows for datum translation really, really matters. Um, having multiple teams in the field that are localizing over not necessarily internally consistent points can cause an issue. And like I said, those RTK and PPK processing errors, that's the biggest one right now. That one really processing RTK data for, uh, for drones. You can check out our website actually. We just posted a new workflow or a new blog post about our workflow for use it, utilizing RTK and PPK data, how we process that data for very large project sites, sites with a couple thousand photos and multiple base station moves. Um, that I, that is worthy of its own presentation and far beyond what I could go into. But the short answer is we use both RTK and PPK data often in conjunction on a single project to ensure the highest level of accuracy and precision. Both are very important and both need to be addressed by different technologies. Um, but uh, to ensure the highest level of accuracy and precision in your RTK and PPK project. And Logan, I know you've, you're tight on time, but quick question from the audience. Is there an f-stop you like based on sunny or cloudy days? Great question. No, we keep a lot of those things set uh, to automatic um, because, again, it changes based off of lighting, and you actually do want a lot of your lighting to try and remain consistent. If you try and force camera settings, while it may be perfect for one part of the project site, it works imperfectly for the others. It's better to keep the camera settings we've found at automatic for uh, things like f-stops. However, there's one exception to that, and that is white balance settings. It is a generally prettier picture if you keep your white balance settings as fixed to something like sunny or cloudy, but your exposure settings are uh, set to automatic. Um, it can cause a little bit of error in terms of some motion blur, depending on the lighting and things like that, but that is, uh, we have found of less uh, importance in an overall flight Generally speaking, there it's always tricky. There are exceptions to basically everything, but for, I'm focusing on the middle 95% of projects here uh, are better off with automatic settings um, for everything, um, even with like focus as well. We've seen so many projects where people try to do perfect manual focus and you wind up keeping everything blurry. And when everything's blurry, you can't identify the direct, the center of features and everything gets off by a couple of a couple of tents and you just introduce more noise. So auto settings are much more reliable um, than, than anything else. And ultimately, like I said, I've already been talking about this for you know, an hour and a half now, photogrammetry is just hard. We find errors in nearly half of our clients' projects and from all sorts of different things. Some are just poor mission planning, but some are our software. Some are the camera calibrating incorrectly. Some are the lighting conditions changed and it created a dual surface. Sometimes it's ground control errors or checkpoint errors. Sometimes it's rolling shutter errors or coordinate system and data mismatches. And there is a, that's the reason that photogrammetrists are called scientists. So if you're interested in all of this stuff that I'm talking about, then please check out the ASPRS. They are a great nonprofit organization and have all sorts of research of resources for the academic in you to learn more about the process of photogrammetry and how it works. Okay. That's uh, photogrammetry. Let's spend the last bit of time we have talking through the actual line work drafting and CAD finishing side. Because photogrammetry is really important and it's a great step, but at the end, if, what you, if you go through all of this work and all of that data to then have a 20 gigabyte point cloud, well, you're still gonna have a really, really bad time in terms of getting useful data out of it. So line work drafting is the process of taking those photogrammetry outputs, the ortho photo, the digital surface model, and the point cloud, and reducing it to CAD-friendly data. Photogrammetry outputs are simply too big for CAD. Um, it's too much data. Civil 3D is particularly notorious for just being bad at managing that type of data. So why is it necessary? Well, the files are too big, but it also has too much data you don't need. Like I've shown you before, it has all of this data on the cars, on the vegetation, on buildings, when what you really often need is a clean surface, planimetrics, and all of that. There are these challenges to automated contours. No one wants a topo map where every car has a contour uh, drawn around it. So what is line work drafting and what are the methods of doing it? Well, we say there are okay methods and then there are bad methods. There's no perfect method. In fact, they're all quite time consuming. But let's start with the okay method. 
you can actually draft on individual photos. A handful of softwares allow you to do this, Pix4D is one of them, where you actually select data from the individual photos themselves and then their average location is calculated after the fact in, uh, after it has been processed. So it's not even pulling it out of the point cloud, you're pulling it out of individual photos. You can draft directly on the ortho photo. You can import your ortho photo, the full resolution, full ortho photo into uh, a GIS software typically can handle the ortho photos and you draft on it and it's great data. It's typically, the downside of that is going to be it's only 2D data, not 3D data. Um, and you usually have to do that in a GIS software, not a CAD software. But that's a good, good way to get 2D planimetric data with no uh, elevation information. You can extract data out of the point cloud. You can use uh, point cloud drafting tools to take out individual topo points, to draw polylines and extract various features. And you can also do uh, a method called 2.5D DSM ortho photo drafting, where you're actually drafting on the surface model. You're dropping individual points uh, that are in 3D. This is really good for a lot of topo, rough topo work, things like that. There are, however, bad methods. And uh, I apologize if, I, if I'm you know, getting anyone in trouble here that's trying to do this. The first thing that we don't like is importing an ortho photo directly into Civil 3D. The reason that we don't like this is because Civil 3D can't handle the full resolution ortho photo. So typically you have to downsample that to a lower quality model in order just to get it into Civil 3D. And that means you spend all of this wonderful time, all this hard work on photogrammetry to get everything accurate to a tenth, and then you just throw it all out the window just so that it can work in your software. So we think Civil 3D is an awful place to do the drafting, the line work, the data extraction out of it. It's a great place to put everything together at the end, but it's a terrible place for the actual drafting. Likewise, because uh, the ortho photo is lower quality, it's a bad place to draft on it. What we call dumb decimation of a point cloud is a really bad way to do it as well. Using a software where you import the point cloud and then just say, I'm going to delete 90% of the points because I need that this file to be smaller so that it's more manageable. Once again, you took all of this good data that you just created and threw away 90% of it. It's just a, a bad way that you lose a lot of your high quality data, especially when you're doing like curb lines. It makes all of your curbs look messy. Any of your straight lines, your paint stripes are all going to look really ugly and terrible if you just throw away a whole bunch of your good data. So don't do that, but the other methods are okay. And quite frankly, like with photogrammetry, this is, there's very much an art to line work drafting of what's the most efficient way. Each one of these methods has its trade-offs. Some are a little bit faster, some are a little bit more accurate, some work better in noisy projects, and some work better in more smooth, consistent surfaces and that sort of thing. That said, there are, like with photogrammetry, there are different options for how you can process this. There are a lot of new technologies out there for automated software uh, analysis right now that promise to upload your data and poof, it'll give you back line work or something. Those are cheap at scale, although actually a lot of the latest ones are not cheap at all. They're extraordinarily expensive and cheaper than even draft or and more expensive than drafting it yourself. Uh, the benefits are that they're very quick. The drawbacks as we see it with any of the automated software analysis, even the most cutting edge one right now, is it requires an enormous amount of QAQC. And in fact, the amount of quality assurance and editing work that you have to do on it often, doesn't, often is more than the amount of time it takes to just draft it yourself. So while this is something that we keep an eye on very closely and we think there's a lot of potential to more automated drafting technologies out there, right now it is very, very limited in its ability to actually get high quality data in any sort of efficient manner. The other option is in-house drafting. You could take the uh, ortho photo, you can take the point cloud in-house and you can extract the data you need. It's very high accuracy, reliable known product. The problem is that it's typically very expensive, often limited labor in terms of the amount of people that you have that you want to throw at it. And it's extremely time consuming. Anyone that's worked in line work drafting knows that that's tedious and boring. And the other uh, option is for a you know, minor plug for us is to hire a photogrammetrist like Aerotop because we actually have photogrammetrists, we have drafters and we have CAD technicians that are specialized with all of these softwares to know what's the most efficient methodology to extract for that individual process so that we're affordable at every scale we charge per project as any pro good photogrammetrist does so there's no 
monthly long-term commitment or something, and we have all of the you know, tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars of hardware and software um, that we've made those investments so that you don't have to. Um, but those are kind of your options for how to do line work drafting is just automate it, which again, there's, there's potential that technology, but typically it is not good enough for surveyors and engineers. Do it in-house, which is great accuracy, great control, but very, very expensive and difficult to scale up or hire a company that uh, is experienced in it. As far as the software, we, we mentioned that we're proudly powered by PIX4D on the photogrammetry side, though we do have access to other softwares. It's not nearly as clean cut with line work drafting. We use a whole bunch of different stuff from Autodesk project, products to GIS products like ArcGIS and QGIS to point cloud products to all kinds of different things. Um, we use all of these. We have licenses to all of them because they all have their benefits and trade-offs. Like I said, some are very accurate, some are very fast, uh, some are very expensive, some are not. Some have good automation tools, some have really poor automation tools. And being able to have multiple tools in your tool belt for this sort of thing uh, really helps. But here is the screen of just a handful of the ones that are worth, um, worth looking into. Ultimately, when it comes to when push comes to shove, line work drafting takes a lot of time. Unlike photogrammetry, photogrammetry takes a little bit of human time and a lot of computer time. Line work drafting takes very little computer processing time, but a ton of human processing time. And then a lot more human processing time. Because it's tedious. You do need to draw those paint stripes. You do need to uh, draw the break lines and identify features that you should include and that you shouldn't. You need good quality assurance and uh, quality control through all of it so that if something should be drafted, it is. You need to have multiple rounds of QA and QC. And so far, there are no magic solutions. Right now, there's a lot of buzz around AI, machine learning, blah, blah, blah. And quite frankly, I would love for us to get to a point where that is a magic solution for line work drafting. But quite frankly, like a lot of technologies, it's just not there yet. Hopefully, we'll get there, but it just isn't yet. And the last thing with that is you need to have CAD drafting standards too. This is another kind of important part of something that, uh, that has become, we have multiple meetings every single week, multiple hours about our CAD drafting standards just to make sure that, okay, when you're actually drafting something, you need to do it consistently. If you don't have standards, if you don't have a plan, then when you draft something from one day to the next, you might follow different things. So this is everything from the simple stuff like, what layers you're using, what colors you're assigning to them, all the way down to how do you mark curves? On the left, it's things like how do you deal with damaged concrete and drawing lines on that? The second photo is how far apart do you space your topo points when you're creating a topo surface? How many lines do you draw on a curb for curb lines? How do you interpolate lines underneath trees where you expect a road will go underneath, uh, a underneath tree cover? And how do you mark all of that? Having good CAD drafting standards is another critical part of that line work drafting phase that uh, every surveyor should at the very least think about as they, start, um, as they start drafting and extracting data. No matter who does it and how it's, uh, it's done, there should be really good standards associated with it. Okay, so that's the data extraction side. Last step of all of this is going to be CAD finishing. Now CAD finishing is the process of putting it all together into CAD and making it look like a survey, your site culture, your annotations, all of that. First thing is to merge all of your data. Merge your field shots with your drone data. Drone data is, tip is really, really great for topo surfaces, brake lines, paint striping, edge of pavement, curbs most of the time. You can always get uh, back of curb and edge of pavement really good with curb lines, but the flow line is actually a little bit trickier depending on varying flight characteristics. Uh, but merging it with your field data, things like boundaries, building corners, stuff that I've gone on before. Creating a surface in CAD, getting your major and minor contours, adding your annotations with that, your actual tin surface and your mesh surface is pretty important there. Applying your custom layer templates as far as what it's called, what the different colors are for it. Improving visibility and usability, that's by turning your layers on and off, adding your annotations, making sure that your map scale is right, adding symbology for things like trees and power poles and fire hydrants and manhole covers so that they all have their symbols. And then another trick is adding in CAD-friendly imagery. This is one that we get questions about a lot and have done an enormous amount of work on creating CAD-friendly imagery. 
Now, if you remember, I said earlier that one of the bad ways to draft was to import an ortho photo directly into Civil 3D, and that's true. But you do want imagery in Civil 3D so that you have context with your site. You can see something. You know what's there. You know what it is. But good CAD-friendly imagery needs to be small enough that it can be easily transferred with the file, maybe so that it can be emailed, so that it can be printed, so it gives context. So we actually have numerous advanced compression technologies that we use, um, everything from advanced TIFF compression to more proprietary uh, ECW wavelet compression technologies as well that allow us to get the highest quality imagery in the lowest amount of data so that you get really, really high quality data that's still in CAD. Now, it's typically still not good enough for drafting purposes, at least in our opinion, especially on bigger projects. It is having a step of adding, creating and adding in CAD-friendly, properly compressed imagery is a really important step to the CAD finishing process. And again, you get your final project, which should look the same whether it was made conventionally or with a drone. Okay, we're, we're through it. Let's go through then just a basic summary of kind of all of this, and then I'll happily open the floor to any questions that people have about all of this stuff. So again, the, the workflow that I've gone through is a lot about making sure that this drone program does save you time and money, that you are getting good data out of it, but in a way that takes less time than doing it than traditional technologies and cheaper than before too. And that means, like I said, you pick the right tool for the job. Drone photogrammetry is amazing, but it does not do absolutely everything. You do need to utilize a complete workflow. Taking any one of these steps in isolation won't actually get you there. And in fact, just blindly, blindly feeling your way through by buying a drone and then seeing like, ah, I'm gonna fly the job and job site and see if I can get any useful data out of it. None of those will actually get work or get you good data. One example um, that we've seen before is that some, that you wanna avoid having good gear and a bad workflow. This setup that you see here is a high-end micro drones, an Intel Xeon processor server, full licenses to Pix4D, Trimble Business Center, and TopoDot. This setup will cost tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars and often take 50 to 60 man hours per project. And we've seen drone programs like this and they're often canceled because even though the data quality is absolutely top notch, they're so expensive that they don't actually create any value to the company. They don't, they don't satisfy that save time, save money. Alternatively, you could buy a Phantom 4 RTK, work with a company like Aerotops, where you fly to site, shoot control, send it to us. We do all of the photogrammetry, and by day two or day three, we are delivering complete line work files. And what that means, it's a much smaller upfront cost. You're not buying all this crazy hardware, a couple grand for uh, maybe a Phantom 4 Pro or a few, like ten thousand dollars for an rtk and it's all you know major upfront investments needed and save like i said save time save money that's the goal so a little bit of a plug like i said these are all the lessons that we've learned um we do offer this as a service if you are interested in learning more about that you can go to aerotoss.com book to book a live meeting and learn more about our line work all of our photogrammetrists and cad technicians are here in the usa we professionally draft survey grade CAD files and get you all of that wonderful stuff in CAD form. Um, and with that, uh, you may have noticed that this deck is a little different than the one that you probably got already. So please send an email to me if you would like a copy of the deck or have any other questions. And with that, I have a feeling that we are going to have some more time or that we are going to have a handful more questions that I would love to take the time to address. No open questions at the moment, but we do have okay. 13 minutes, so. So we'll give a couple of minutes, I was, uh, which we can talk about. Uh, if anyone doesn't have any questions or any issues with the, uh, the photogrammetry side, I'd be more than happy to, uh, to help out. Um, otherwise, we'll stick around for another minute or two. Um, and if you do, like I said, if you do have any questions or do anything that, or um, want to learn more about them, shoot me an email, book a meeting with us. I'm sure everyone's getting tired. In fact, we do offer, for what it's worth, free demo projects for anyone that has a drone program and is struggling with anything or just wants to see what our drone deliverables can look like. Um, 
and we can gladly help you out there. You know, Logan, we do have a question. Uh, what benefits Great. and drawbacks to TopoDot versus Pix4D? Yeah, so that's a great question. And one of the interesting things about them, those are not, those are different pieces to the software stack. So Pix4D is a photogrammetry software that gets that photogrammetry side. TopoDot would address the line work extraction side, where typically with TopoDot, you're going to be taking, so you use Pix4D to process photogrammetry and that gets you a point cloud. You take the point cloud and you import the point cloud into TopoDot and TopoDot is a very high quality point cloud processing software. If you have a license to TopoDot, you know that it is extraordinarily expensive, but it is among the better point cloud processing softwares out there, uh, especially for, as the name implies, DOT, Department of Transportation, major corridor projects and that sort of thing. Um, and it's also very good at the point cloud and it's iffy on some of the other data. Um, but they're really different parts of the, of the, the stack. Pix40 is photogrammetry. TopoDot is more in that uh, line work drafting phase. And in fact, to go back here, yeah, there we go. Pix40 and photogrammetry right in the middle. Uh, TopoDot covers the line work drafting stage. And then Logan, I've got a question for you here. What is the max wind and wind gust you find is acceptable for a good product? Ooh, that's a fun one. Um, that is highly dependent on the drone and camera you are using. So um, I will start with a phantom with the phantom series of multi rotors and really the vast majority of multi rotors. Uh, they can actually handle very significant winds because they are on a gimbaled camera. In fact, I have my phantom 4 RTK right here that's on this camera gimbal. So when a gimbaled drone gets kicked around by the wind, the gimbal is actually able to compensate that no matter how much the drone tilts, the camera itself is still pointing directly down exactly where you want it. So multi-rotors can actually, uh, multi-rotors have no negligible impact from uh, wind or wind gust in terms of data quality. Now there could be safety issues a drone typically can't handle uh, more than 20, 25 mile an hour uh, winds or like 30 mile an hour gusts become unsafe to fly a multi-rotor, but the data quality is very good. Now then, the other thing that you need to address is fixed wing aircraft with non-gimbaled cameras. Now that is a lot more of a nuanced question because a fixed wing camera is oftentimes non-gimbaled and it is going to be kicking around like crazy. Um, and part of it, I should actually say, that's, that's something that we haven't done independent testing to test that specific question as opposed to what the maximum wind velocity and gusts are. And it, I, usually that is because the issue is more with safety than anything else. Um, the EB that we found is a very reliable platform and just sticking with the manufacturer's specifications there um, will get really high quality data. Even when the thing is kicking around, it takes a lot more photos. Those might be circumstances where actually increasing the number of photos and increasing the overlap can get you high quality data, even in the case of high winds and higher wind gusts. Um, I know that one's not as much of an, of an answer. I wish I had a perfect answer for that one, um, but that's, um, that's the answer. I've got a couple more questions for you, Logan. Uh, do you prefer flying on safe mode or stop at every photo mode? Which one do you recommend? Great question. Uh, our research has shown that you do not need to stop at every photo. It certainly doesn't hurt at all. Um, but the, the, there is no meaningful decrease in accuracy by stopping at every single photo. There is a very meaningful increase in the amount of time that it takes to, uh, to process. Um, so when you stop at every photo, I mean, a five acre site will take you 20, 30 minutes and the, the ability to do a, a multi thousand photo large job by stopping at every photo is absolutely completely impractical, like beyond impractical. Um, and the, and you can still get very high quality data even without having that stop at every photo thing. So it just keeps flying. Thank you. And then switching gears, what is causing that weirdness in the surface by the sidewalk at the beginning of the presentation? The one with the line work overlay, probably talking about the artifacting you're seeing. 
yeah, let's see it. It might be this one that we're seeing some artifacting. And it's a good question. And I'll actually, uh, I don't know if this is exactly the slide, but I will address the broader question of what causes weirdness in surfaces? Because there is a lot of weirdness in surfaces for a lot of different reasons. And sidewalks actually happen a lot. So I'll start by saying that this is the job of a high quality line work drafter to be able to uh, see and adjust for these types of things. So what you see on the left are a handful of artifacts, some things that look weirdly stretched. And this like right here is kind of a major spike in the middle of the sidewalk that is obviously impractical. There is not a weird, perfectly vertical, uh, four foot high concrete pillar in the middle of the sidewalk for no good reason. Um, that is an artifact and that particular artifact that can happen very commonly on uh, concrete and asphalt comes from the nature of how digital photogrammetry works. So digital photogrammetry works by finding individual points that are common across every photo. Now for areas that are very uneven, for example, this like roadways, paint striping, cracks, the way that the software works is it finds the cracks, it finds the individual points and matches those and it starts creating a surface based off of all of those millions and millions and millions of different points that it matches up. However, in perfectly uniform surfaces, perfectly uniform being brand spanking new asphalt without a rock, oil stain, dirt track, anything like that, perfectly uniform asphalt, you can't find and match the same point across multiple photos, or at least you as a human can. The software tries, it tries to match patterns of the gravel's a bit darker here, and there's an oil stain here, and a rock here, and then matches that across a dozen photos to create a surface. But it doesn't always do it properly. Sometimes it has artifacts where it incorrectly matches some of this stuff. And then it creates a point that doesn't actually exist. A point in the point cloud that might be a foot high or a foot low. And I don't have any slides with me on this, but those artifacts are a natural and I would say unavoidable part of the digital photogrammetry process right now. And the way to address those is a good CAD drafter or a good line work drafter will see that data and know to throw it out. And as they are creating a surface, as they are extracting the points and break lines, they will make sure that it just interpolates straight through that and assumes when there is an artifact that it is just clean and, and uh, straight through across that. So it's a great question because artifacts, even in perfectly processed projects, artifacts happen and you need to be able to deal with them. And you deal with artifacts best in the line work drafting stage. And then I know, I think we're at the five minute warning, but I got two more questions for you. First, can you talk a little bit about ground sampling distance and how PIX40 calculates that during uh, flight plan preparation? Yeah, great question. So ground sampling distance is uh, the best way to think about it, it is the resolution of imagery that you expect once you smash everything together in an ortho photo. How many centimeters per pixel it is. Now that is resolution. That is not accuracy, nor should it be confused by, for accuracy. Um, a general rule of thumb is the best accuracy that you'll ever get out of a project is three times what your ground sampling distance is. So if your ground sampling distance is three hundredths of a foot, and the best accuracy you can hope for is about a tenth of a foot. Um, PIX40 calculates that. It's an estimate of the resolution, how sharp that photo is going to be. The higher you fly, the lower your uh, ground sampling dis distance is, the lower your overall photo resolution. And uh, this one is actually kind of about the time it takes. You mentioned a lot of human time. Generally speaking, mm -hmm. how many man hours, maybe per acre, does it take to perform the drafting and CAD finishing on a given site? Ooh, that's a great question. And I'm going to be annoying on that because I have with a lot of these. <laughs> and the answer is it depends. And it depends wildly, like hugely so. If you are working on just a clean, straight, freshly paved dirt site with very, very few uh, obstructions or anything, it's, it can go really, really, really quick. Um, so CAD drafting might be, oh gosh, I'm trying to figure out, you know, it, you might be able to do a couple acres an hour, no problem, you know, five, 10 acres an hour or something with really, really simple stuff. However, then if you go to really, really dense projects, 
urban sites with curb lines, utility access panels, paint striping, vegetation, you know, all tons of cars that you need to fix, all kinds of uh, artifacts that you need to interpolate around. That can take, I mean, for the, the most dense stuff, it can take a couple hours just to do a single acre of full-blown uh, CAD drafting. So it's, it's so wildly variable. And then it looks like we've got two minutes left. I've got another question. Camera frame speed versus drone speed. Yeah, so shutter speed versus how fast the drone is flying. This is typically going to be adjusted by the autopilot automatically. Um, and the, it's related to lighting conditions. So when you keep all of the settings on automatic, which as I said, you kind of should, if it's darker, the camera, the camera shutter has to stay open for a lot longer. Um, and that means, generally speaking, you need to fly slower. However, that is also dependent on accuracy or on, uh, on the flight altitude. The higher you fly, the faster the drone can go, even with the same drone speed because of their of other just general trade-offs. Generally speaking, there are a lot of formulas and things that you can use to guess it, but the vast majority of autopilot, uh, autopilot softwares handle that automatically and do so very well, including the ones that we like, just the uh, e, um, Map Pilot and DJI Ground Station RTK, those all just handle that sort of thing automatically, and that's the easiest way to handle it. Awesome. Well, I think we're about out of time, but as Logan said, uh, we've got a virtual exhibit hall so you can book time with us and happy to answer questions in a one-on-one -on -one setting or as Logan shared, his email address is logan at aerotas.com. He can get you the updated uh, presentation slides because they did change a little bit or answer any questions that you have offline.